four, three, two, one. Fragments of Silicon making the bold statement that storms suck. That's a bold stance there, uh, Alex. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Anyway, getting some feedback there. Uh, right. Uh, welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon, Tuesday edition. Uh, that means another European interview. Uh, joining us uh, this week is uh, Michael Havari of House Mark. Hey, how's it going? Um, it's going good. It's going good. Uh, just a note for our listeners here, this interview is going to be a bit shorter than usual it's going to be about 30 minutes as opposed to our usual 45 hour daily on uh, tuesdays that's due to our guest time constraints so um without further ado let's get into it uh let's see we got two games to cover uh today the first one is next machina uh right so for those who might not be familiar with this particular title, what is Next Machina? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, it's an it's an arcade type of a top down shooter mm-hmm. where you uh, you take on a lot of robots. Um, basically, it only has two buttons. Uh, so you know, if you look at the PlayStation Four controller, it's the L one is is for Dashing around uh, R1 is for special weapons. Other than that, you just use your twin sticks. So, yeah, it's a very classic kind of a twin stick top-down shooter. Uh, Indeed. Uh, I put in a few hours, and it definitely reminds me of um, classic twin shooters of old. Um, And there's a connection here, because um, this game had some consultation with... uh, uh, I guess the genre creator, as it were, Eugene Jarvis. Yeah, that's right. The the man, the legend himself uh, from Skokie, Illinois, was was very much involved involved in in the process, and uh, it was very cool to hang out with him and kind of just you know shoot the shit and find out all those things that uh, you know he had going for him, and you know show our stuff also. Indeed, and. I suppose the question beckons, uh, how did you get, uh, get into contact with Eugene Jarvis for this project? Well, as as with many projects, we got drunk in Las Vegas and just met with the guy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was the basis. And then uh, he got to know our games a bit better, and uh, it kind of grew from there. But we were at DICE Awards uh, when Resogun was nominated, and, and he was there getting his Pioneer Award, so in the end... 3 a.m. a hotel lobby with drinks, and that's that's where it started. <laughs> was it a long session? Then it wasn't really. It was just uh, you know three or four drinks. Um, so I mean, that was the beginning, and then in the end, it took three years of uh, making a game and filming a movie to to get it done. So uh, extended that's... session. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, there's a two-player uh, productions documentary, isn't there? Not, not a two-player productions. Okay. It's a, okay. It's a new, new Dawn documentary movie. Ah, there we go. But still uh, similar. That's what, that's what was throwing me off there. Like, and um, uh, how much did um, Eugene Jarvis ultimately contribute to Next Machina? Well, I mean, these are things that are very hard to quantify. Um, in the end, if you think about a, a consultancy role, uh, you right. can't really say how much he didn't code a single line into the game, if 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 we take it from that perspective. But he gave us a lot of good feedback and input, and uh, he was an overall awesome guy to hang around with, and had a had a lot of knowledge from 
you know, the genre. So in that sense, he gave us a lot, particularly code wise, not nothing at all. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And in terms of like, you know, invo invocations of his past work, um, uh, was there any particular title that was influential on uh, Nex Machina here? Robotron uh, 2084 this is the quintessential piece um, having the thematic similarity having um, really being the dawn of twin stick shooters in itself um, so that clearly gave majority of the influence uh, Smash TV uh, was another influence into the level structure and then the, the two player uh, side of things but out of the two Robotron clearly would be the breadwinner here. Yeah, I could definitely see that with um, a lot to do with the human hostages. Like, yeah. Uh, but it, like in terms of structure, it's definitely more Smash TV. Because Robotron 24 was like single screen um, waves of enemies um, versus Smash TV's rooms um, construction. Yeah, that's right. So exactly those parts so it is a combination of, of both titles and sense and on the inverse um what did you come up with to make this game stand out from those um titans of the genre as it were i don't know uh you tell us i mean <laughs> it's very hard to be critical to towards your own baby and uh right. it's uh it, i honestly I think we put in uh, our our twist to it. We add a lot of, uh, you know, modern tech and uh, really really good controls. Everything was polished out. Um, I think controls wise, it's a uh, gameplay wise, it's very much a house mark um, title. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very hard to compare to those titles with such, let's say, good controls, but still there's a certain finesse that you can only get with the. Uh, with, with modern tech. So I guess tight gameplay would be one thing. Mm -hmm. Like, and um, how does this contrast with your previous work, um, Alienation? Um, it, Alienation was a sort of a loot and grind type of a ordeal where, you know, you could almost call it Diablo with guns. Um, you'd have a four player co-op, you go in, uh, you, you know, gear up and, and level up and that's more of a, you know, sit down and go through the cycles. Uh, here it's more of unforgiving, uh, make a mistake and, you know, you won't get that position on the leaderboard type of stuff. So this is your classic uh, NES sort of uh, really brutal game, whereas Alienation is a bit more forgiving, a uh, bit more RPG elements. I, I, I can def I could definitely tell that um, when I was playing it uh, the other day, it, it brought back some memories of like uh, playing Smash TV on the NES or Super NES. One like, of the best best iterations ever on the Super Nintendo was was Smash TV when they really well you couldn't do twin stick shooters because you no home console had a you know twin stick controller on it so. Mm -hmm. You had to you had to make the best of the D pad and the and the four face buttons on the SNES. Yeah, it, it worked surprisingly well. I I played the shit out of that game. Excuse my French, but <laughs> that was a that was a pretty uh, quick kick ass uh, port. Yeah, like I don't know how the uh, how well the Genesis version turned out. I never played that one. I'm I'm not aware that there ever was one, but maybe there was. I think there was. I don't. I, I don't personally recall it, but it was either it was either bad or just didn't exist. We'll look it up later. Yeah. To be God. honest, I I don't think you could have made a Genesis version. It just wouldn't have made sense. Like, it wouldn't stop people from trying. Like, but blast processing. Like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like. I, I'm like. I think the first really great twin stick shooter on a console I ever played was actually um, a version of Robotron, uh, Robotron 64. If you've ever played that. That's sure. right. Uh, also on a console with only a single stick on it. So. Actually, you could play it uh, dual stick style. Yeah, there was a dual option. 
you had you just had to use both analog uh, control, you know, two analog controllers. Which back um, in the day, that was super expensive. Yeah, it's like you, you had to have two N sixty four controllers, but you could do it. Like, oh, okay. I yeah, that unfortunately that also limits your button availability. Mm. Like, or you can because do that it, like, your, both of your hands would be on the the uh, center things, which really only had the sticks and the triggers. Yeah, well, it wasn't the most elegant of solutions, but it's all you had back in um, 98 or uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it's like Resoga, um sorry, um, <laughs> Next Machina is definitely a um, modern uh, twin-stick shooter. You know, it, absolutely, absolutely. It's, like, it, it's got a lot of neon to it. <laughs> like that's which, That's one of the things we like to add, yeah. Yeah, I gotta admit that's not always my cup of tea, if only because it, it makes things hard to follow. <laughs> but anyway, get, getting back to the game itself, um, was there any particular reason why this game took three years to develop? Well, uh, three years might be extending it a little bit. I mean, I was sort of counting from the initial inception um, of starting the talks and so on. The development cycle in itself was still more than two years, but maybe not uh, exactly three. Uh, and to answer your question more directly, yeah, we did a whole iteration of the Resogun engine. Um, took way longer than we were supposed to do on it. And, uh, you know, with internal tech, you you kind of have a whole, whole other battle at your hands there, too. So, um, yeah, it, it took a while. Admittedly, we don't get too many people who do uh, who do things in their own engines. A lot of Unity, a lot of UE4. That's right, that's right. For Matterfall, we did use UE4, um, but again, still a process of getting that started too, so. Right, um, well, was Matterfall uh, like developed in, um, in parallel to Next Machina? Yeah, I mean, they, they launched two months apart, so mm -hmm. must have been, huh? Yeah, it makes sense. Right. Anyway, um, sticking with Next Machina here for a little bit more. Um, this game actually came out for the PC and the uh, PlayStation 4, and um, I believe it's your first self-published title. Um, was there any particular reason for that? Uh, yeah. So we did want to uh, work with Mr. Jarvis, um, and we didn't really know if that would fit the usual arrangement we have with with sony and xdev studios um so from the beginning that was kind of a uh an, a deal that we we would try to aim for self-publishing it mm -hmm. and uh yeah also we, we don't, we're always looking at the pc market as an option so got the opportunity to um try that out too and uh how has it been working out so far well uh, it is a, it is a, you know, always new things take a little while to get used to, but I think we have a quite a good handle on it. So, um, you know, just takes a while to get everything running smoothly, but, you know, we'll get there eventually. Uh, it's good to hear. I mean, yeah, it is a new endeavor, but I do think the game stands out quite well, if only because... There aren't as many twin stick shooters on the market now as there were, say, in the Xbox 360 generation. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. I'm like, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, but yeah. Uh, now, given that this game was self-published, um, I, I suppose the question is: Would there ever be a chance to see this game on like the Xbox One? Well, it depends on. A number of factors uh mainly uh on the fact that if the title itself sells enough copies so we can fund it um but uh you know everything's always a, a possibility fair enough fair enough and i suppose along those lines um would the nintendo switch be a consideration or is that right out because of the power differentials uh well, that's again a, a very good question and a probably the basis of the assumption being that tech-wise it would be hard-pressed to get it on there. Um, we did 
did have an external porting company working on the Resogun port that eventually did come to Vita. Um, it's not this exactly the same experience that you get on PS4, but uh, still it works. So, yeah, I guess I suppose it would be a possibility. Uh, duly noted. I'm like, and that's probably the approach that would have to be taken, although probably not as cut down as, uh, you know, Vita development would be, given that. No. In the end, it would be more of a complete um, port, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we could find the magicians out there who can <laughs> actually do it. So it's, it's quite a tough ask. Uh, I'm sure they exist somewhere. I mean, th th there's a whole um, subset of porting studios out there. Like, um, let's see. Uh, uh, I think we should move over to Matterfall. Uh, yeah, all right. Time. Uh, give me, uh, give us a moment as um, our stream operator has to switch from uh, the next Machina game to the Matterfall footage. But All right, I should be just about ready. All right, um, go ahead. All right. Um, right. Ah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got that part. Anyway, um, so Matterfall is a bit different from the uh, usual, um, let's say, housemark fair, but still uh, in keeping with the idiom, I think. Because um, for those who might be listening to our audio version and who couldn't see the footage, um, this is a side scrolling uh, shooting platforming game. And yeah. uh, it, like, and that kind of separates it from you know, the usual housemark game, which is a uh, twin stick shooter. Um, but on the other hand, it, it, it looks like um, very in keeping with your uh, with the aesthetics of uh, you know Next Machina and Resogun and what have you. Hmm. Yeah, um, we did a, another platformer which was in the Metroidvania genre. Mm -hmm. uh, on the 360 and the PS3 era uh, and got later ported to PC. So that's actually available uh, right. called Outland. Um, it was done yeah. with, and with uh, Ubisoft. Yeah. I, oh, I, I remember I, that one. Yeah, I've actually played that game. It, it's pretty good. Like, sadly, I'm kind of um, underrated or uh, and underplayed. <laughs> um, right. I think, Anyway, so um, what was the um, kernel of creation in Matterfall here? Well, um, a lot of the same team that was on uh, Outland actually um, came together for this. And um, we started with, a, let's say, a European classic game um, from the Amiga days called Turrican. Hmm. Uh, Turrican was also released in the States. Uh, but I don't think it was as popular there as it was in Europe. Uh, so that's, a, if you don't know, it's a side-scrolling platformer where the character can shoot into, um, well, multitude of directions. Mm. And uh, we made a prototype based on that idea and then started developing it further. And uh, the end product uh, had a little bit of that, a little bit of Mega Man vibes to it and, uh, and a lot of... Uh, uh, Gunstar Heroes, which is very much one of my favorite games from from Treasure, mm -hmm. and um, I guess those were really the the ending influences on on what Matterfall end up ended up being. Like, 
So not often I hear people use um, Turrican as a building block for their game. Like, Dude, yeah, we're Europeans. That's uh, very much... I actually know the guys at level 5 who made Turrican very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're big fans and, and good friends of theirs. And uh, um, yeah, very oh, much... I understand completely. It's just, you know, the Turrican games over here are, yeah, uh, once again, kind of underrepresented. Like we got them, but yeah, they weren't we, very big. Yeah, because of me. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. well that was, uh, yeah. And again, you know, looking back at the, the late 80s and early 90s, there's a lot of games lost into obscurity, and uh, it really depended on the, uh, let's say, local networks of distribution mm -hmm. not uh not the global market that is it is today back in oh, the yes. day when most games were shareware passed along but through floppy disks that's oh, right that's right yeah and we're talking even before then oh, we're talking about the days where you know your platform of choice is probably was probably going to determine where you were going to be popular I mean, <laughs> you know it's like you know, the Amiga was a thing here, and it's got its fans, but, it, you know, it was never the sensation it was in Europe. You know, it, it's unfortunate. What was, the, was it, what was your equivalent? You had Commodore 64, or? We had the C64. Yeah. Um, once again, not as popular um, as it was in Europe, but it, it made its mark. Um, we had the Apple II, the TRS-80. The, um, the big one um, would be PC compatibles. Yeah. Right. Like, but yeah, ultimately, after a while, just consoles caught on here a lot faster than they did in Europe. And, you know, eventually... For wins. us, for us uh, you know, Nintendo 8-bit was huge. Mm -hmm. It was... That was really the beginning of the era. I think in the U.S., with if you look at the uh, Calicos and, and Atari systems, we had, uh, like, the Atari 2600, but... Uh, Really, the big hitter was 8-bit uh, Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, that is actually a bit different from other parts of Europe where um, Sega. <laughs> Sega well, system. Master System, Master System had a a good run, I think, in Southern Europe. So looking at you know Italy, Spain, um, but then Sega Mega Drive, as we call Genesis over here. Um, that was a, a big, big force, true. Oh, yeah. But uh, Super Nintendo, I think, enjoyed a similar run during that time. Mm -hmm. Maybe even bigger. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, what is the premise of Matterfall? Well, I mean, again, we're very fairly story uh, light uh, with a lot of our titles, but this is actually one of the games that does have a story. Um, basically, yeah, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're you're a, a you're sort of a a cleaner uh, of sorts. You're a consultant in a, in this kind of a global or interplanetary troubleshooting community where you just get sent to a, a alien planet um, that has been inhabited by humans for a while, and there's a mining uh, operation and a human community there. Uh, but something's gone wrong, so you have to go in and actually take care of whatever that problem is, and you learn more about the issue as you you go into the planet and then deeper actually into the core of the planet. So that's kind of the setup of the title. Right. Sounds, uh, sounds fairly standard for this kind of thing. Right. It is. Right. And um, how frenetic is this? Uh, is it another fast-paced um, arcade, or is it um, a bit slower in the pacing. It's a bit slower compared to Next Machina, but much, much faster compared to Outland. So overall, I'd put it in a very fast <laughs> category. Uh, so yeah, it does require, especially on the, the higher levels of difficulty, it's, it's quite a fast ordeal. And um, is this game very score heavy, like um, some of the other games? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a bit less score-heavy than most of our games, but still, there's a, leaderboards are a very central factor to it. Um, so I'd say that if you play casually, 
you might not even notice the score element per se, but uh, if you're a perfectionist and you want to be good at the game, then definitely um, the leaderboards and the score system is a central part. And um, I suppose one thing we haven't really talked about yet for either Next Machina or Matterfall is the music. Um, uh, who yeah. did the composing? So Ari Bulkinen, um, who has a company called Ari Tunes, uh, he's been uh, composing our music since Super Stardust HD, and uh, he's been doing a great job with, with basically all the titles uh, since then. So, yeah, you can actually get Nex Machina and, and Matterfall soundtracks on Spotify, mm -hmm. or, or even buy an Ex Machina soundtrack online. Hmm. Casual God. plug. <laughs> well, you gotta, you gotta take the chance. Of course, of course. Um, is the next mic in a soundtrack on Steam, and can you get those on like the PlayStation Four? Um, currently, no. Uh, we're we're trying to. So what we're looking at is that there's a movie that's about um, the making of Next Machina, and you know us chilling with Eugene. Um, this should be coming out later this year, uh, and we'll probably bundle that movie and the soundtrack um, to be a deluxe edition with Next Machina. So hopefully at a later date. Um, any sort of release window there other than later in the year, or is that still up in the air? Um, I honestly couldn't say. Um, it's an uh, outside company, and they have three years of film footage to go through, so hopefully they're working through that fast, but um, I wouldn't know. Um, end of year is what they're kind of, you know, giving me as an ETA. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of uh, trailers online if you guys want to check them out at some point, but... Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all the information I have for now. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, I see we're getting a little low on time here, so I'll wrap this up by asking if you can talk about anything um, in the future, or is that still um, in the shadows? Well, I mean, I'll give you kind of a vague hinting of something to come. Um, we will most definitely still try to uphold our... our status as the, well, maybe the self-proclaimed, but still uh, kings of gameplay. Uh, we will definitely uh, try to create games where your thumbs will go numb and you might throw, throw a controller or two. But uh, one thing that will be for certain that we will ev eventually at least be trying out some cool new things, um, maybe even very different from um, what you've come to um, understand as a housemark title. Then again, Matterfall might be very new to uh, a lot of the housemark audience, so I don't know how different things will be, but I'll just leave it at that. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, I'll ask my colleagues here if they have any last questions. So, um, oh, go ahead, Golix. No, you, you go first. Um, I was just going to ask, does Matterfall have, like, any um, Metroidvania elements that look like in the video, or do you can you just, like, go anywhere whenever you want? So Matterfall is less of a Metroidvania, so there's no, um, there's very little need for any kind of backtracking. Ah. There are some secret areas and so on, but the, the level design in itself is fairly linear. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's less of a Metroidvania. All right. Um, Alex? Yeah, I was mostly just going to say... Um that the, uh, the matter gun in Matterfall looks pretty interesting, and uh, I'd, I'm interested to see how that plays out more. Yeah. More um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very different kind of a weapon, and um, it's, it's funny, actually. It's one of the most tech-heavy sides of the game is how the, the crystals of matter are constructed and... Um, tiny detail, but a lot of visual work went into making um, those things there. Yeah, so. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah. Well, like, that is a hallmark of um, House Mark titles. Um, a lot of visual um, happenings and goings on. Particle like, effects uh, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you guys a little uh, tidbit information there, too, before we go. Mm -hmm. um, Next Machina, it's our engine and everything, but just the water and that game reacts to everything and it's all physically enabled. Mm. Uh, it took us four man months just to make the water. Next Jesus. Month. Wow. That, that's a 
pretty and nobody notices. Nobody notices. <laughs> Isn't that the best when you put like months and months into something and no one notices? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, we could be we could be doing things a bit differently, but then again, you know, perfectionists, what can we do? Well, it's one of those things where, like, if you put in a lot of effort to make sure everything comes out just right, barely anyone can tell you've done anything at all. Yeah, but if you put little yeah. effort, people are gonna be like, "Oh, this looks dumb." That's right. That's <laughs> right. Hopefully, we can we can ride that one for a long time to come. <laughs> all right. Um, well, I think that'll about do it. Um, you know, I, I do wish we had more time, but um, the half an hour has expired. So. Um, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule for being with us uh, here today. Um, Absolutely. Been, in, been enjoying uh, Next Machina. Um, looking forward to seeing what you uh, you guys at Housemark uh, do next. And hopefully we'll have you on the program again when uh, whenever your next project's ready to be talked about. Well, whenever you guys see any hints of that dropping, you just give me a call and uh, we'll have another session. All right. Okay. Uh, not a problem, not a problem. All right, um, so yeah, that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Be sure to join us for our um, Wednesday evening show as we welcome Bradley Erickson of Bison King Game Studios. We'll be talking about the game Deadly Edge. Until then, I wish you good gaming. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, fans. Alrighty, I put the post show.